the uh, fixed bed reactor, this is a diagram of the argon reactor to the all. The catalyst is contained in tubes, and they're around the tubes, the steam is boiling water, the boiling water and steam is generated. Uh, this design has a special grid holder, many of the catalysts that he dumped. And actually what happens is that uh, liquid is produced as you, as you react in here. And there's actually a liquid phase and the liquid draw at the bottom, and then a gas draw off off the side. The flow is down through the tube. Next slide. <coughs> So considerations with regard to reactor weight, and why this is important is that the cost of these reactors can be pretty closely correlated with the weight of the reactor. In the slur reactor, uh, the shell weight is closely related to the volume of the reactor, uh, and this is because the shell weight is proportional to <coughs> diameter, length, and wall thickness. The wall thickness, in turn, is set by diameter and reaction pressure, plus a corrosion allowance. So the same factors that are affecting uh, body also affect reactor weight. There's, there's a reasonable correlation. The heat exchanger tubes are less important in this case than down here. Now the fixed bed tubular reaction has similar considerations on shell design, but the shell the thickness is determined by steam pressure rather than reaction pressure. And this is important particularly if you're thinking about methanol where the reaction pressure is going to be 100 atmospheres. Cooling tubes may contribute some 36% to the total weight. That 36% probably a little over precise. Okay, next slide. I think any discussion of slurry versus fixed bed reactors would be a mess if you didn't consider the experience that Air Products has had at the port of their liquid phase methanol process. As I explained, this is really hydrodynamically and in many respects very similar to what we're talking about for fission probes. The, uh, they tested three types of reactors, an emulating bed with liquid circulation to an external exchanger. You use a larger size particle, so the liquid only has to circulate. And train bed with smaller particles, and you circulate slurry to the external exchanger. And then a slurry bubble problem with internal cooling coils. They move from this to this to this, so they think this is the best. Next slide, please. They run this methyl, methanol slurry bubble column at the port, which is the a two-foot diameter vessel. And superficial gas velocities of 0.15 meters a second, catalyst concentrations of 35 weight percent or more. In fact, they've gone up as high as 45 weight percent without problems, apparently. They have report significant mass transfer effects when they go over 35% slurry. Their cooling coils, less than 4% of reaction volume. However, if you read their articles carefully, at conditions where they're pushing the reactor to maximum capacity, they're actually using that circulating loop too. They probably designed that system for greater mass, undoubtedly. Now, of course, in the, in the methanol situation, conversion is limited by equilibrium, so you're not going to go to a high conversion for mass. Next slide. So, basically, the application here, the Chem Systems, who are the original inventors of this, came up with is the co-production of methanol and power from coal. You get what conversion you get in methanol in a, in a single pass. And you take the tail gas and put them into a gas turbine to make power. And this is a clean coal free selection and looks like a good application for this very reactor. Well, I, I have heard, you know, I had a session on uh, gas and chemicals and a gentleman from Topso talked about a, a design of a fixed bed system once through that sounds quite interesting. So there's, there's options both ways here too. 
Next slide, please. Now we'll talk about natural gas-based fissure troughs, uh, sort of a continuation of what you've been hearing. I don't have to go through it in any great detail. Syngas, by several possibilities, but the obvious one is partial oxidation, producing a gas close to a two to one ratio, which is near stoichiometric for fissure troughs without water gas shift. You don't want water gas shift because it produces CO2 that you don't want. Uh, cobalt catalysts apparently have no water gas shift activity, <coughs> and most of the interest seems to be in cobalt catalysts. And I think you can make a case for either the fixed bed or the slur reactor. And in fact, our study is aimed at coal-based processes. And I'm not going to tell you that shell is better than saddle or the vice versa when I get through. Next slide, please. The, uh, some of the design criteria we're using in our study, we are going to use the same, basically the same conditions as in the slurry methanol reactor. It's 0.15 meters a second, 35 weight percent slurry. We figured the 35 is well below the critical loading of 65 that we calculate you can suspend. We feel quite strongly that previous fissure probes operations have been too low in both gas velocity and slurry concentration. I don't want to discuss that in detail here, but if somebody's interested, I can talk to them about my conclusions. We've also, I don't say it here, but we're pushing the pressure up to get additional capacity out of these units. And under these conditions, heat removal, heat removal becomes quite significant. And I think I told you that number two is moving from this reactor. Next slide. Now, Conversion is usually correlated with space velocity expressed per unit weight of catalyst. Satterfield and co-workers, including some people from Exxon, ran some comparisons that are quite interesting about five years ago. They found that the slurry and fixed bed reactors are quite comparable on this basis. The size and cost of a reactor are related to the reaction volume, as we talked about previously. So the catalyst loading, say in kilogram per cubic meter of total reactor volume, is very important. Next slide. So here I've compared catalyst loadings for a typical situation. I've taken a particle density of 3,100. I see that's 3.1 gram per cc or six, you know. Uh, in the case of the slurry reactor, you've got a, a liquid density, then the catalyst gets into it and it gives you a slurry density. I'm assuming 35 weight percent slurry, and the slurry concentration then comes out 323 kilograms per cubic meter. I take 25 percent gas hold up, I end up on a loading of 242, and then making allowances for heat transfer tubes, heads, and so forth. I end up with 165 kilograms per cubic meter. The amount of catalyst, I can get into that overall reactor volume, the weight of catalyst. For the fixed bed reactor, I'll start with a lower density because my, my rationale here was you're going to use an unsupported catalyst here, try to get high density so that you get an easier separation from the wax. And here you're probably going to use a supported catalyst, so I take a lower particle density. <coughs> but the only the thing I've got going against me here now is the void bulk fraction, which I've taken as 37%, and up with 945 here, and allowing somewhat higher allowance for heat transfer and head distribution. I'm two and a half times the loading of a slurry reactor. I'm not saying that this is the final comparison between the two, but it does indicate that the slurry reactor does start with a disadvantage right from the beginning, the amount of catalyst you can load into it. Next slide. Talking about conversion, where are you going to operate these reactors? Heat transfer considerations limit the fixed bed reactor to low conversion for pass. This is particularly true of uh, quench type reactors or intercooled reactors. But it's also true of the tubular fixed bed reactor uh, that we showed you before. And that is because 
because higher mass velocities are needed to get good heat transfer coefficients. And our estimate is that you need a recycle fresh feed ratio of two or more to get effective heat transfer. The slurry reactor, on the other hand, is best at high conversion for pass due to the superficial velocity limitation. You can put more through it if you uh, go one through. That's what I'm saying. There is a limit to the slurry reactor maximum conversion to the back mix. We'll talk a little bit about that. Have the next slide, please. We've been working with some simplified models that have um, really been published in the literature before, but they assume uh, reaction rate is proportional to hydrogen concentration. They assume a contraction factor, which is constant. Uh, model one is plug flow both phases. Yes, that makes Model two is completely mixed liquid and plug flow gas. And model three is uh, completely mixed both phases, in other words, a CSDR. We feel that model two is what a very large commercial reactor would tend to approach. Now, the, the three curves are shown here at a alpha value of minus 0.5, uh, I've plotted 100 minus conversion against 1 over space velocity, except I've got the reaction rate constant in here. So I've got a, a sort of a modified Stanton number there. And I plotted it for KR to the KM is equal to 2K. In other words, I'm adding resistance to 1 over K is equal to 1 over KR plus 1 over KM. And I'm, I'm taking 50% mass transfer resistance. And under these conditions, model two does give you a number intermediate between model three and model one. But some of you may ask me why I pick 50%, which is pretty arbitrary. The fact of the matter is, though, that you're probably in the range of 10 to 20% mass transfer resistance from our calculations. But as, as mass transfer resistance becomes less important and it becomes reaction rate control, then logically and in an actual arithmetic show us this model approaches this model. So that with reaction rate controlling, uh, model two and model three become identical. And what you see here in, in these models is a sharp tailing off in performance as you get to high conversion capacity and require larger and larger space loss. Next slide. Please. So now we've taken that model two prediction and we worked up curves of space time yield and recycle ratio. This is the space time yield curve. I've got two cases, one for no inerts, 100% ultimate conversion and ideal case, and another with a more practical situation of one and a half percent inerts, 95% ultimate you see here this, in this more practical case that space time yield, well, the fixed bed reactor is going to operate, say, in this range here. So you do achieve higher space time yields, but you do it at the expense of having to circulate more uh, recycle gas. This is the external recycle and fresh feed ratio. The sort of reactor, on the other hand, can operate at high conversions. However, you notice that. This is a smooth curve, actually. This is computer generated, so. But the space time yield tails off rapidly and you get over 90% conversion. Uh, you probably, in a, in a coal based plant anyway, you would not want to produce this, uh, leave this unconverted hydrogen in CL. You have no use for fuel gas, really. So you're probably going to set up a recycle situation. Say you design for 90% conversion, you recycle this much. 
In the time for 80% conversion, you have to recycle twice a month, but it's still a small amount. And look at the improvement in SDY. I really, our design is going to be based on 80% conversion. Next slide, please. As I said, we're really interested in coal, and the DOE is really interested in coal-based controls. And this is really a special situation. Since this game is low in hydrogen CO ratio, you see from the different gas fires, water gas shift and CO2 removal are required now. But the water gas shift reaction can be carried out in the fission probes converter, and the <coughs> reaction where you use two molecules of CO for one of hydrogen, as the main reaction, you still get some of the other. And you produce CO2 as, as your product. This CO2 is more readily removed than the CO2 up front. So you both you simplify feed gas preparation in several ways. You don't require a separate water gas ship reactor, and, and CO2 removal is simple. Next slide. Now, this third reactor has some distinct advantages, you think, for this low hydrogen CO ratio gas situation. Since low hydrogen CO ratios can lead to carbon formation, but the slurry reactor catalyst sees a higher hydrogen CO ratio than that that exists in the gas phase. And this is because of differential, uh, the difference in diffusion coefficients and the fact that you are reacting twice as much CO. So you're probably going to make less carbon, and maybe you didn't even eliminate it, but you can tolerate some carbon production. You don't want it anyway. It'll get in with your product, but at least it doesn't plug up the catalyst. In addition to which, in the stir reactor, the catalyst can be continuously replaced. And this I see is one of the biggest advantages and the place where you should really look for applications of the slurry reactor. Cases where you have to take a fixed bed reactor and dump it every couple of months and are, are, are not too satisfactory. Uh, and, and this is where I really see the advantage of the slurry reactor. In addition, the uniform temperature gives you greater flexibility and there's indications that you can run the uh, slurry reactor at a higher average temperature than you would the Say you can run the slur reactor at end of run temperatures for the fixed bed reactor. So you really have to design the fixed bed reactor for a lower temperature. And that compensates for the difference in loading that I talked about before. The disadvantage, of course, is you require separation of the catalyst from the product. And this is an additional separation, which I'm sure can be done, but it's an additional step and difficult. Next slide. So my conclusions are that the slurry reactor appears best at high conversion to pass and low recycle ratio. There is a limitation to the back mixing, and I wouldn't design these uh, necessarily for 90% conversion. I might go somewhat lower than that. The fixed end reactor is best at low conversion to pass and higher recycle, and this is primarily the heat treatment. But uh, I, I, I suggest you look for applications where these criteria are met and that coal based fishery probes don't be such an application. Last slide, please. Our future plans then are to actually cost out the methanol mixed alcohol reactors and do a process evaluation on fishery tropes where we look at the cost differential for a slurry reactor processing low hydrogen to CO ratio gas is directly from the gas fire, from the shell gas fire, versus fixed bed processing with feed gas adjustment by shift in CO2 removal to two to one ratio. Now that covers my story. I'd like to acknowledge the fact that uh, we had some consultants in this, Ivan Ackerman and Joe Smith. And also that uh, a number of my respected people have been helping with this, with this study, including Sam Tambacker in the corner, who has some copies of my paper. Thank you.
Now we use the code. That's why we can still get it. But it would be better, you know, we probably make more profit. 